morning, friends. Today we're going to continue in Genesis 16, and we're going to talk a little bit about Sarah. And what did Sarah do in this interaction? We know that Sarah sent Hagar to her husband Abram because she thought that, you know, through Hagar, if, if she would get pregnant by Abraham, that she, Sarah would have a family. And, and you think about deflection of blame. So I wonder, has anybody out that's, that's watching or viewing this morning ever deflected blame because of a decision they made that didn't go the way that they thought it would or an interaction didn't go the way they thought it should, that you begin to deflect the blame? And I know I can do that if I'm being really honest. You know, if something happens out of a reaction, I might say something like, well, I only did that because of what you did to me. And, you know, instead of just owning what was ours, and we see in that text that Sarah does that, she goes to Abraham and she says, look, you are to blame for what I'm going through right now. You know, my, my slave became pregnant and she began begin to despise me. And in the Hebrew text, it, it really translates that, that Hagar began to see Sarah as dishonorable. And part of me thinks, you know, what was Hagar supposed to see her as? You know, she had been used by this couple with no rights of her own to stop any of this. And she became pregnant by this. And so Sarah goes to Abraham and says, look, this is your fault. And thereby deflecting blame. She says, I put my slave in your arms, in your hands, and now I'm being mistreated by her. And then Abraham goes and tells her, well, this is your slave. Do whatever you think is best. And I pause there because, you know, what would you do in, if somebody said, what, do what you think is best? And we learn in the text the very, very next verse. The only thing that it Sarah, says Sarah did was, so Sarah mistreated her. And, you know, we as Christian people, no matter what happens to us, we are supposed to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That's what Philippians 2 tells us. You know, I'm wearing a shirt that today that says love everyone. And sometimes that can be super difficult, but we are to be held to a higher standard. So Sarah mistreats this girl. And so Hagar runs away, you know, and, and I wonder, you know, if any of us ever just wanted to run away from a relationship, you know, you, you might be stuck in one right now and saying that I've, emotionally I'm running away, spiritually I'm running away, even if it's not physical, but some of us physically want to run away. And so we're going to switch and shift to Hagar. So we have a woman who, you know, has no rights, no standing, no say-so, no ownership of her own life. And she goes through this orde ordeal and she runs. And I, I'm, I'm guessing she's running back to Egypt, what she knows. So she's out there in the middle of nowhere, wondering if anyone loves her, if anyone wants her, if anyone's there to help her. And we see this beautiful interaction of the main character of this whole text, which is God. And God meets her in her despair. And God meets each of us in our despair, too, if we're just willing to look for him. And he has this beautiful interaction where he tells her, first you know, you need to go back. And sometimes God wants us to be somewhere and, and wants just our simple obedience in that and just to listen to and follow God. And he promises to bless her and give her many descendants. And then he promises to bless her son, Ishmael. And, and he gives this weird compliment to us, but it made sense to her when he says, he's going to be a wild donkey of a man. Now, to us, that may, might not make, make much sense. But you think about a wild donkey was free. And to a woman who had grown up a slave, or, or at least we know at this point of her life is a slave and has no freedom of her own, God offers her and says, look, I'm going to give your son a life you never had. And that interaction was so beautiful that she says that I have now met the one who sees me. And I just want you to know God sees you too. He sees you whether the, you know, things are going well or things are going bad. He is there and he sees you. And she says that. She says, I am calling you the God who sees me. To me, that is beautiful. And 
whatever that interaction was like for her, it was not one that caused her to keep running, but it was one that caused her to lean on God and say, okay, God, I hear you. I see you. You see me. You love me. I'm going to be obedient to your call and I'm going to go back to what you sent, where you sent me. And I can't think of anything more beautiful than that. And I, I just want you to know, church, that God sees you too. And that you can lean on God. And for the next couple days, we're going to talk about, you know, what God offers each of us. And we're going to spend two days talking about that. So I look forward to spending that time with you. God bless you. And again, God sees you. See you tomorrow.